short and exciting matches, several dozen unique units and distinctive playstyles, and a unit deck building system adding an element of strategic decision making to the game. There's a lot to like about Battle Aces and a lot to get excited about, particularly for fans of competitive RTS play coming from StarCraft and WarCraft communities. But the game is not without its limitations and challenges, particularly around trying to monetize the finished product. With this second wave of the closed beta, many more of us have had a chance to experience the game. So let's jump in and see what Battle Aces has to offer. You have two resources which are being collected automatically, so no micring or building workers, it just happens for you. The first one, the red one, is Matter, which essentially is used to pay for the more basic units. The blue one is Energy, which is used for teching up and for also buying the more high cost technical units. The third figure you see is the Supply, which is very much like Starcraft or Warcraft, and each unit you produce has a particular supply cost associated with it. And once you reach a cap of 200, also the same as StarCraft, you can no longer build units because you've maxed out your army size. So when it comes to the macro and base building side of the game, it's all essentially automated for you. If you choose to expand, you press one hotkey and a new base will automatically appear on its expansion spot. And after a certain amount of time, the workers will become active. In terms of producing your army, there are no buildings for these. Essentially, they all just pop out of your main core, which is your main base. And to construct units, you just hold down the hotkey or press the hotkey for one at a time. In terms of scouting, it's good to see the composition of your opponent's army. Other important things are just given to you. For example, you'll be told if the opponent has expanded, and you'll be told if the opponent starts researching a particular tech, either the foundry, which is ground unit based, or the starforge, which is flying units. You will also see the unit deck card for your opponent, which is essentially the eight different types of units they can produce, which they have selected prior to the game so you can see everything they're capable of building. In the vast majority of my 1 vs 1 matches, games have ended by one of the players forfeiting because they are too far behind, but the way to actually win is to destroy the enemy's core. Games are capped at 10 minutes, and when 2 minutes remain, resource collection for the main base ceases, and you enter sudden death with 1 minute to go, where essentially, it's rather opaque as to how it's calculated, but there is a scoreboard, or like a progress bar at the top, which shows you who is winning the game. This is based on units killed, bases expanded to, resource collection, all that kind of thing. The sort of scoreboard metrics from StarCraft that give you a higher score. And basically you've got one minute to change that if you're losing. So games are short, they're frantic, they're heavy on harass, there's lots of uh, unit runbys into mineral lines, flying harass because the skyboxes behind the bases are massive, and just constant skirmishing, and trying to have the correct unit mix to counter what your opponent may be building or planning to build. Taking a step back from the battles themselves, there is a strategic planning element to the game which involves setting up your unit deck. The units which you choose in your deck will then follow you into the matches you play, and you've got quite a lot of choice here, so you can really express yourself in terms of your playstyle and what suits you. So of these 8 unit slots that are available to you, the first two are reserved for the core units. These are essentially cheap and available as soon as the match begins typically only costing the base resource as opposed to energy. Next you have one unit from the Foundry and one unit from the Starforge, typically ground and flying respectively. Next you have two slots, one for the Advanced Foundry and one for the Advanced Starforge. In game these represent a second tech upgrade, so very expensive to reach these, and these are high-end, expensive, powerful units typically. The last two slots give you some further choice and flexibility, they basically allow you to choose any Foundry unit, be it Basic or Advanced, and any Starforge unit. So you can either double up and have two Basic units, or you could have more Advanced units. Over the course of development, there's been a steady stream of new units released, and I think the model going into the full release of the game will be to continue to do this, and to try and monetize this process. After a bit of uh, discontent amongst the community and back and forth between us and the developers, we now have access in this beta to every single possible unit which we can now include in our decks. This will not be the case in the normal version of the game. I think the plan is for there to be a sense of progression and also potentially a season pass and the idea is to gradually unlock units over time and the challenge for the developers will be to try and make this fair and not pay to win but also they have to monetize the game and adding new units and making it some sort of fee to access these is a way to do that. 
when you first play the game, you have access to a basic but effective tutorial, and then you have access to one versus one matchmaking in the Proving Grounds. Your goal within the Proving Grounds is to win 12 matches. Along the way, you unlock various rewards for doing so. Once you've completed that, you then have access to 2 versus 2 and 2 versus 2 versus AI. You also then start playing proper ranked 1 versus 1 with a ladder ranking. This is when the progression systems really come into play as well. You have some daily quests which are essentially trying to win a game, destroy some units, that kind of thing, and you earn currency once a day for that. And then you have the warpath, which is like the proving grounds on steroids. As you do battle in game, you earn experience, and this gradually moves you along the warpath as you level up and receive rewards. These rewards range from in-game currency to unlocking new units to cosmetics such as emotes and animations. Some of these are free, some of them I notice say premium, which is not active in the beta, everything is available, but I think in the future the plan is for these to require some kind of season pass. It really reminds me of the TFT season pass in League of Legends. Now one thing which really jumped out at me as being a potential red flag is I noticed two of the units along the warpath were under the premium banner. So that means unless you pay real money, then potentially you'd have a smaller pool of units to choose from than your rivals who have splashed out the cash. Now the developers who have been very active and are very engaged with the community have stressed many times that this is just a beta test and nothing is final, particularly in terms of the monetization model. But it does signal that they're thinking about things like this and that really is skirting on the edges of pay to win. So they need to be very careful. And I think the fan base has been very vocal in pushing back on this. One of the first things that hits you about this game is the really tight art style and the fantastic cinematic. For these, they've partnered with a London-based studio called The Line, who are notable for having worked on Marvel Snap. I was really impressed by the anime style cinematic and how faithful it was to the design of the game itself. Some fans have even looked at the displays and have been able to see what unit decks the characters were using in the cinematic. When the Kraken unit appeared in the cinematic, it almost reminded me of the angel battles in Evangelion, which is high praise indeed. I was also pleasantly surprised, particularly for a beta, by how well the game ran and how smooth it felt. It's clearly been optimised to run on all manner of computers and devices and make it as accessible as possible. And I found it, apart from occasional lag spikes because the beta is only hosted in America, I found the actual game itself to be buttery smooth. I also found the controls to be responsive. It felt like I could move the units around in the manner that I wanted to, and the interface was clean, logical, and you could rebind anything you wanted. Another option which I was pleased to see was the ability to turn on focus fire, which then allows you to do run-bys and target down workers, perhaps focus down a building or a large unit which needs to be killed quickly. The idea of games being limited to 10 minutes really appeals to me and I think is a somewhat novel idea. Sometimes when you play a game such as Starcraft, there's an element of fatigue where maybe you get a mirror match, Terran versus Terran, and you immediately know that there's the potential for this game to last hours, and it may dictate the way you play. Maybe you'll be like, I don't want to be stuck here, so I will cheese. Well, in Battle Aces, you know exactly how long you can expect to be there, and you can play the game you want to play. I think this also helps to reduce the idea of ladder anxiety. It's much less crushing to lose a game which is 5 minutes long than to have lost a 1 hour plus Starcraft match, and I think it makes the game more accessible, have a broader appeal, because people are less daunted by the idea of 1 vs 1 ranked. Now there's a huge asterisk next to this statement which is based on whether they end up doing pay to win or not. I find the deck building element to be really interesting and really fun and it really adds a level of strategic expression to the, to the game and I think it's a huge win. The core RTS gameplay mechanics haven't really changed in 20 plus years and I think one way you can innovate is to combine genres or subgenres of strategy titles and I think deck building is a nice mix with RTS and I also think the approach they've taken to APM, removing unnecessary APM sinks such as making workers, making construction buildings, automating these things is novel and a good approach and I think it could be the start of something interesting. I'd also single out the development team and their level of community interaction as being a huge positive. Many StarCraft fans will be familiar with the name David Kim and he's spearheading the project 
he was previously, I think, the esports coordinator at Blizzard, and I think he was also involved in Balance for StarCraft 2. And he is super active on the Battle Aces subreddit, and he's doing some really good work there. A great example of this was when a lot of players had feedback that they would like to see unit cards showing the stats of various units, things like their movement speed, how fast they attack, their range. And while that cannot be implemented right now in the beta, what David Kim quickly did was share loads and loads of spreadsheets on the subreddit with detailed stats for every single unit. It's also encouraging to see that the development team are open to criticism and fan feedback, and they are changing accordingly. For example, when the, the beta began, there was a monetization system, MTX, microtransactions, and it was very much a slow grind. Many units were thousands of hours of play away unless you paid to win, and there was outrage from fans. Quickly, based on this feedback, they reverted to making all units free and accessible, and they have vowed to go back to the drawing board and think about monetization anew. Now the game is not without its challenges, and of course the elephant in the room is monetization. One of the big attractions is definitely the deck building element of the game, and in order to do that you need to have various different types of units fulfilling the same role, which you can chop and change in the unit deck, otherwise there's no choice, the deck building's not really an attraction. But as things stand right now, there are probably just not enough units in the game, period. So this is an acute problem which could be better over time as the unit pool expands. But it's very clear that the monetization plan revolves around drip feeding these units to us. And if you want to get them more quickly, or if you want to get all of them, then you have to spend some real money to do so. To give this a bit of context based on the beta version, before they reverted this, in the week where they had the, the drip feed model and the pay to win and everything implemented, it would have taken you 524 days of consistently playing and completing daily quests, working your way through the entirety of the warpath to unlock all of the units in the game. That's an incredibly long time. And when you consider that the, the unit pool is not that massive right now, to be limited so heavily like that basically makes the whole unit deck building side of things completely irrelevant. They have to monetize, but they also need to avoid alienating their core fan base, which are the types of people who will balk at the idea of pay to win and not having access to all of the units unless they pay money. That will just not fly with a large part of the player base. So this is an ongoing issue which has to be solved. Now it's been mentioned, and I think it's definitely an upcoming feature, the game desperately needs to have unit stat cards that tell us things such as the move speed, the attack range, things like that because there are many units which serve a similar purpose, but we don't quite know the difference between them. Some of them might move faster, some of them might hit harder but slower, others shoot faster but do less damage. We need to know this kind of stuff because it really it informs our deck building choices and makes things a lot more rewarding and interesting. I think another area which could use some improvement is the visual acuity of the units. I find that some of them are quite similar to each other in the way they look, and Without being able to click on these, to see their names, to see their stats, or even just mouse over and see what they are, I struggle sometimes to tell which ones are which. So I think it'd be definitely a good quality of life fix. That and working on making the unit models just more distinctive. Now while I've said I think the 10 minute game cap is a really novel and good feature, the 10 minutes is actually an irrelevance because in the entirety of my 1 vs 1 ranked, and I've played a lot, I have never had that become a relevant factor in deciding who wins the game. The only time I ever even entered sudden death was when I AFK'd for 5 minutes so I could build a Kraken. <laughs> so it's not really actually happening in practice. I think either the cap comes down to something more like 8 minutes or tweaks are made to the game design so that games just go slightly more slowly and then things will be more in line with what's actually happening versus the length of the cap. The one other issue or potential issue which I would highlight is the idea of balance. I don't just mean balance around win rates, but also balance around pick rates, something you'll see very often in MOBA games. So a champion might be close to 50% win rate, which is what you want, but nobody's playing it, or everybody's playing it, or everybody is banning it because it's too annoying. 
In a game with lots of different units and the plan to introduce more units to make more money, there is a real balance challenge and a real pick rate challenge as well. And to give a bit of uh, colour to this, there's a core unit called the Wasp, which essentially functions like a speed zergling from StarCraft. It's very fast, very mobile. If it gets us around, it can kill things, and it's fantastic at doing worker runbys. If you expand and your opponent has Wasps and does not expand, you have lost the game right there. So while I don't know if the win rate of Wasp players is dramatically higher than 50%, what I do know is that almost every single person that I played in the ladder from Platinum rank onwards was making Wasps. And it's just so game-breakingly powerful because it influences the playstyle. If your opponent plays Wasps, you have to turtle. You have to wait for them to expand, wait for them to tech up, and you're constantly playing from a defensive turtling position. So while, where it might not be straight up super OP as a unit, it's OP in the sense that it dictates the entire playstyle and tempo of the game. It's very hard to make an argument to take any other core unit in your deck when you have the potential to take Wasp. This is what I mean when I say pick rate balance. They need to make all the unit deck units as viable as possible, as attractive as possible, so that there is variety and choice and genuine other options. Because right now there's a cookie cutter meta of spamming Wasps and these are the kind of sticking points they need to try and avoid. Now, of course, we're talking about a closed beta so there's no, no real point in discussing, you know, specific values like movement speed, attack damage of these units or anything. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that they will have a monumental task on their hands to balance this game and to keep it balanced as they introduce new units. And it's something they will have to actively manage throughout the life cycle of the game. In a world where we thought that the battle to replace StarCraft Brood War as a competitive RTS title was a two-horse race between Zero Space and Stormgate, it turns out that the, the winner may be a third title. When it comes to allowing players to express their skill, Battle Aces is doing extremely well. I also found the matches, and there are custom games by the way with spectating, which I forgot to mention, the matches are really watchable. I found Stormgate matches to be a little bit drab to watch, you know, they're quite slow, Rush distances are too long, I think the maps are too big. Battle Aces is just 5 minutes of absolute carnage, but carnage that you can follow and understand. There's a genuine attempt here to innovate, to do things a bit differently, and I think the ideas on display have some real promise. I think capping the game length is good, I think it takes away a lot of problems associated with ladder anxiety and everything else. It improves accessibility, and I just think that everything they've done, apart from the monetization, is a win. <laughs> so it really comes down to, can they find a way to make this game sustainable financially? I would say though, just a word of caution, and perhaps a bit like StarCraft Food War, for many people, they'll enjoy this game. But for some, it might be the kind of game that they, they enjoy watching, but they don't really enjoy playing it, because it can be quite frustrating. If you get stressed out in StarCraft by the idea of zergling runbys into your mineral line, or the idea of flying units like Mutilus harassing your mineral line from behind, then you're going to have a tough time in Battle Aces because there are so many speed zergling type units in the game, there are so many harassment flyers, and the skyboxes behind the bases are just humongous, and you can't micro the workers. All you can do is try and run around and put units in the right positions. So the games are short, the games are fast, and the games can be a bit stressful. So sometimes it might be better to just sit back and spectate and watch parting knock lumps out of the Muslim or something. <laughs> a really engaged and well-respected development team. Really fun gameplay, really watchable, and some fantastic novel ideas which are to be commended. So there's a lot to be excited about here, and I really hope they can solve the monetization riddle, because if they can, we've got a winner here. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum, you have games which are entirely about positioning units and the tactical planning phase of the game. So these are called auto battlers. You don't micro them at all. And I recently played one called Mecha Bellum, which I was extremely impressed by, and it really it breaks the mould of these types of games because it's actually really detailed, really in-depth and complex. So if you want a bit of a low-octane 
strategic cerebral type of game, take a look.